Welcome to the C3 AI Digital Transformation Institute colloquium series. Our mission is to attract the world's leading scientists to join in a coordinated and innovative effort to advance the digital transformation of business, government, and society. We are a consortium of several wonderful universities and companies, and we are supported in large part by the C3 AI. We have a series of talks that are coming up. Take a look at the topics and the people who will be speaking. All of this is at the same location, same time, same place. And you can take a look at what we have done in our colloquium on YouTube. And former things are always there and the new ones are put there shortly thereafter. Today, as in previous times, we will have a 40 minute presentation. The Q&A will be at the end of the talk today. So put your questions into the Q&A box. Uh, if you like a question that you see, you can upvote it and then it will get asked earlier. We will answer as many questions as we can during the time at the end. And today's talk is called AI Enabled Deep Mutational Scanning of Interaction Between SARS-CoV-2 Spike Protein S and the Human ACE2 Receptor. Our speaker is one of my colleagues at the University of Illinois, Dewakar Shukla. He's the Blue Waters Assistant Professor in the Department of Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering. His research is focused on understanding the complex biological processes using novel physics-based models and techniques. He received his BTEC and MTEC from IIT Bombay and his MS and PhD degrees from MIT. He did postdoctoral work at Stanford University and he received numerous awards for his research, as you can see. Thank you very much for being here and I will pass this over now to Dewakar. Thank you. Uh, let me share my screen. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, I will begin my full screen. Uh, so, uh, uh, thank you, Tandy, for the introduction. And uh, I will talk to you about some of the work that we've done in the last. Uh, 10 to 12 months uh, on this uh, very interesting problem. Uh, it's a, I would say it's a, it's a very um, good example of the collaborative work uh, that we're doing uh, with, uh, with Eric Proko, who is an assistant professor uh, in the biochemistry department, which is just one floor above uh, my lab um, in Roger Adams laboratory. So uh, I will talk about um, some of the uh, things related to the coronavirus and how it binds to uh, the ACE2 receptors in human. Uh, so what has happened? What happens is, uh, and I think all of all of you now know about the coronavirus biology, uh, is that there is a spike protein um, on top of the the viral envelope, uh, and then it binds to this um, this receptor shown in red, uh, which is an ACE2 or uh, angiotensin converting enzyme two, and this interaction is very critical. Uh, and uh, most of the interventions that we are seeing in terms of vaccines or in terms of uh, uh, antiviral drugs, they're all basically designed to, uh, a large number of them are being designed to uh, block this interaction. So for example, uh, you'll, uh, you know, one of the ways you can block this interaction is having uh, engineered ACE2 decoys. So these are proteins that are basically like ACE2, and then they can go in and bind to the sky spike and, and block it. Uh, you can have small molecules doing the exact same thing. Uh, monoclonal antibodies, uh, you know, so from uh, many drug companies, including, um, you know, Ally Lilly, for example, has a, a MAB or a monoclonal antibody that actually interacts the spikes and blocks it. Uh, and then obviously from vaccine, what you're getting are, um, you know, a lot of antibodies in our body are getting generated, uh, which are essentially doing a, a similar function, right? Uh, so this is a, a very interesting area of research, and there's always new papers uh, coming out, and I'll show you, uh, you know, what we have been able to do. Uh, in this uh, field of blocking the spike, uh, so the you know the, the, this idea sort of started at uh, uh, I would say in the summer of 2020, uh, like all other people working on coronavirus, uh, and uh, this interaction is very very important. And when you look at uh, this ACE2 protein right here, and then you look at this domain of the spike protein, which is called RBD domain, uh, this domain is binding to the to the receptor. 
And, uh, you know, at the very beginning, when the first crystal structures and the, even the sequence was available, uh, everybody started realizing that this virus can mutate. Uh, because if you look at the, um, if you look at the uh, interface, uh, there's a lot of variability in the residues of the interface on the virus side. Uh, on the other hand, so, you know, that's what we are seeing now. There are a lot of variants. The other approach, uh, if you look at the other side of the interface uh, between these two proteins, uh, the ACE2 side, uh, so you can also think of engineering an ACE2 uh, protein uh, that can actually mimic the, uh, mimic the uh, receptor in our human body and then actually bind this. So you can think of a, you know, sort of an arms race where you can design different types of ACE2 proteins uh, that bind to the different variants and we'll see some of it coming in the, in the future. Okay, so you know, how do you go about designing it? Uh, or um, even, even a more uh, fundamental question, how do we go about elucidating, um, you know, um, residue level information on how this affinity between the, the ACE2 receptor and the spike protein can be tuned, right? So, you know, uh, some of the ways in which uh, people have tried to uh, look at protein um, uh, mutations in proteins is uh, you can make a theoretical model that can actually be used to predict the effect of a mutation. Now, all these models are uh, sort of designed based on the sequence information. So you have a lot of this uh, sequence data uh, coming for the wires, uh, and then you can align all those uh, sequences, get a really nice alignment. Uh, and then from that alignment, you can get conservation of individual residues, uh, their coevolution and other properties of the sequence. And then, then you can use it to learn a, a model, which is called the POTS model. And then you can use that model to predict the effect of the mutations, right? Uh, so one of the papers that I've cited in the, at the bottom of this uh, um, slide, uh, you know, has actually uh, done something like that. And uh, it's called EV mutation, uh, you know, evolution of and mutations. That's the title. And it's developed at the Harvard Medical School. On the other hand, you can also think about doing experiments uh, where you're doing deep mutational scans. So uh, for, for the computer scientists out there, I would say what deep mutational scan is that you have the sequence uh, and then you are uh, doing, uh, you're generating a library of mutants of all possible mutants, uh, uh, you know, uh, using an error board PCR or some other technique. Uh, and then you can, uh, you basically have this big matrix, which is all amino acids in a, in a protein and you're doing all 20 amino acid substitution for all the sites. So you get this really nice, uh, a single point mutation uh, versus function um, landscape, you can say. Some people call it the mutational landscape, right? Uh, so, and then when you have this single point uh, mutation uh, data from the experiments, uh, then you can really figure out which mutants are, are better at binding, which mutants are, are poor at binding uh, the spike protein if you're looking at the ACE2 uh, variants, right? Uh, and uh, so, so this scene seems very, very um, uh, interesting. Uh, you have these two approaches. Uh, but if you look at the theoretical approaches, and that's the first thing that we tried to do, uh, was let's just go and find out any of these variant effect predictors and try to predict um, the performance of the ACE2 variants in binding the spike, um, right? Um, and um, if you look at the performance of all these uh, different predictors, uh, it's not very promising, right? Uh, look at the R square values. And these are some of the very popular ones. Okay, uh, so these softwares are available online, um, available on GitHub, and we can just pull them and, and look at their performance. So none of them were working. Uh, and luckily at the same time, we were working on um, our own version of a variant effect predictor, uh, which we call as uh, STL mutation uh, or, or transfer learning of mutations. Uh, and uh, when we compare our performance to the popular uh, predictors like EV mutation and InVision and SNAP2, you know, we were doing a really, really good job. Uh, and you would say maybe the R square of 0.65 uh, approximately is not that good. Uh, and so uh, I, I want to say we have on the x-axis in all these figures uh, is the experimental data that we got from the deep mutational scan. And on the y-axis is the, is the score that we predict that this mutation would uh, uh, get uh, based on the mutation. So in terms of its ability to bind the virus spike, okay? Uh, so. So you're seeing this, um, you know, R squared is 0.65, but when you look at the experimental data um, in the next, next slide, uh, you know, the experimental data, if you repeat, if you have uh, two replicates of the experimental data, uh, you get an R squared of like 0.75 to 8. So it's a pretty good, uh, I would say, agreement, uh, given that the experimental data is noisy. Uh, 
Uh, one other thing that used, uh, so this is the matrix that I was talking about from experimental data. Uh, and this paper is from my collaborator, Eric. Um, um, and uh, this was published uh, last year in Science. And what he has uh, been able to show is uh, the blue uh, points here, uh, you know, the color shows enriched interaction. Uh, so if you have a, if you're a muti if you're a residue number, you can look at the residue number here on the top. And then these are all the amino acids. And this star is when you remove it, when you remove that particular residue. Uh, so when you look at this, all these mutations, you can see that there are there are a few blue spots here, uh, which basically means that uh, you know you can pick uh, potentially these residues are enhancing the interaction between the spike and the and the protein. Orange points are all uh, you know uh, breaking down that interaction, and the white points are actually are in the middle, right? Uh, but then you also find that there are a lot of these black dots here. Um, and the reason why we have all these black dots in this experiment is because for some of the variants, uh, we just didn't detect expression or uh, there, was a, there was some problem um, in terms of generating that mutant. Okay, uh, so, you know, um, one of the, you know, the key conclusion from this uh, data was that, you know, the interaction of the ACE2 is suboptimal uh, and it can be engineered to be a much better binder. So the idea was, uh, that uh, we can take the ACE2 from wild type and introduce, let's say, you know, um, few mutations in it and just make it a, uh, let's say, a few orders of magnitude better binder to the spike than uh, the wild type protein in the human body. So if there's a virus circulating in some person, uh, you can inject this uh, mimic and potentially neutralize the virus in the uh, body. So the n uh, strategy is now becoming really popular because we are finding a lot of people, even after vaccine, are getting serious cases. And at that point, you need these uh, types of antiviral drugs to uh, neutralize the virus, right? Uh, so it's very interesting, uh, uh, but this is, uh, but the problem here is uh, we are missing some of the data as indicated by the black dots. And then the other uh, point is uh, that this is just single point mutation data, right? So let me, uh, let me first look at the data. Uh, so if you look at the data, where are the beneficial mutations? Uh, most of the beneficial mutations are at the uh, shown in the shown in the blue are, are, are localized in certain regions around the uh, around the interface. Uh, they are also located, you know, I would say one interaction shell away from the interface. There are a lot of mutations uh, like that. And then uh, and uh, we also found a lot of mutations around this uh, uh, glycosylation site N90. Uh, which were very, uh, very uh, beneficial for binding. Okay, so that's what this looks like, uh, experimental data. Uh, now, what one other thing that, you know, we were getting all these single uh, substitution and that's all great, uh, but then the single point mutations were better than the wild type and these are all the mutants that you're seeing on the x-axis. These are all the mutations in the ACE2 that actually makes it a better binder. But then if you are measuring, uh, you know, uh, through a flow cytometer, uh, you're measuring the fluorescence change, uh, like shown in this, uh, or the even the expression of the ACE2, that's also an indicator of a, of a better protein. Uh, there is a very slight difference in the, in the fluorescence that we were detecting when you're doing these experiments. Uh, so the, you know, the conclusion uh, sort of was that we definitely need higher order mutation data to identify better mimics with high binding affinity. And the other point is also was also very clear. It's very extremely challenging to obtain this data experimentally, right? So you can imagine that you can do a, a single point mutation, like 20 mutations for each site. Uh, then it is n cross 20 uh, sort of experiments you are doing, um, or the size of the library that you're generating is uh, 20n. But now if you do a second order mutation, then suddenly you know uh, you have a lot more combinations uh, to deal with, right? So it's not possible experimentally to generate these very high order, high order map. And I, I only know of just one data set till now, uh, which has done second order mutants, but on a very small protein. So uh, this was clear to us. Um, and then, uh, you know, our approach was, uh, you know, we said, okay, we're doing uh, these deep mutational scans. Can we do transfer learning of these deep mutational scan? Uh, so uh, this approach we called TL mutation, as I mentioned. Uh, so what we are doing is uh, uh, we, tr we tried two different approaches here. The first one is already published uh, last year. Uh, and then the, now we have a new variant of that, a new uh, version of this, uh, uh, this which will come out soon. Uh, so the idea here was that we are generating these POTS model 
but now we are also integrating the experimental data that we're getting from the first order mutations uh, to, uh, to further refine the performance of our uh, POTS model. So the idea simply is uh, that we have a, a sequence-based model. Uh, we have data on the expression of, let's say, ACE2 or binding data uh, for ACE2 um, um, virus binding. And then we are trying to optimize uh, the weights. Uh, uh, so let me just hold back to give a little bit more detail here. Uh, so what you have uh, uh, from these sequences, you derive, as I said, uh, you can derive conservation of each site. You can also derive the couplings between individual residue pairs in a, in a protein. And so these JIJs are couplings or interactions between the, uh, these uh, residue, uh, residue, residue pairs. And then what we had did was we attached a weight to these, um, we attached a weight uh, uh, to these uh, these couplings, and then we are maximizing the uh, the accuracy of the predictor, or fine tuning the performance of the predictor, uh, and uh, by setting these weights uh, to a um, uh, between zero or one, right? You so, and with that, then now we can uh, we can transfer this to um, um, a higher order mutation. Or, or to a, a new protein even, right? So if you have, uh, let's say, if you have binding data for SARS-CoV-2, uh, but if you want to predict how would this ACE2 variant do with, let's say, SARS-CoV-1 or other, other coronaviruses, you can also do that transfer in that way. Uh, so uh, how effective was this strategy? Uh, we, we found like definitely 12, uh, 12 data sets or so uh, in literature, uh, which had all the single point mutation data for different proteins. And then uh, you know we asked a very simple question: If we have half of the experimental data, can we predict the other other half of the experimental data? Um, and uh, you know if we compare it to the other uh, variant effect predictors, uh, now that we have optimized the performance of uh, TL mutation on all these data sets, uh, uh, we are able to actually uh, have a much higher performance than the gold standard, which is uh, usually EV mutation. So you're seeing the orange lines are here. Uh, the only uh, I mean, we get a lot of improvement even for data sets that are not complete. So zero to 20 here means how many mutations did you have per site? So these data sets are obviously very, uh, very little in terms of size information. Uh, so it's fine that the performance is still better than the, than the uh, gold standard. Now, so this is pretty good. Uh, we can predict other mutations. So all the black boxes that you are seeing in that, in that experimental data set, uh, they can be filled. Uh, that was good. Uh, the second thing was uh, we found only three data sets which had higher order mutations uh, that were, we could compare to. Uh, and one of the really big data sets. And again, you are seeing that as compared to the gold standard data sets, we can actually predict higher order mutations, uh, which are in this case were the second order mutations, uh, which in a much, much better, which higher accuracy, right? So that was interesting that you have accuracy somewhere um, you know, uh, around 0 0.7, 0 0.8. Um, and then now we have a, a different variant of the of this, so a different version of this software, uh, which is a uh, mutation net. So we have uh, a nice con convolution neural nets uh, that are that are not just taking the the sequence information or the evolutionary coupling information, but is also taking the structural information into account. So now you can uh, look at what kind of um, amino acids are around this protein, and then you can feed that as a as a um, uh, you know as a, let's say. Uh, you know, what kind of now, how, what is the distribution of nitrogen atoms around this residue? What is the distribution of oxygen atoms around this residue? What is the distribution of hydrogen atoms around this residue? And then you can, uh, you can predict uh, based on that uh, local uh, structure of the amino acid, you can actually predict the, uh, predict the activity much better. So now we have uh, a, a good version of this software now, which integrates, uh, um, you know, neural networks uh, and convolutional neural nets to actually predict uh, the performance even better, right? Because we were not integrating structural information earlier um, in the in the uh, in the standard transfer learning uh, model that we were developing. But now we can transfer learning here uh, from all the experimental data that is available on all the proteins, and then uh, we can find we can predict the, the higher order mutations. Okay, uh, so this was pretty good. Um, uh, this paper will be out hopefully in early summer. Uh, but then now let's look at what happens to the predicted uh, ACE2 mutants, right? So you have this TL mutation score, uh, which is uh, which basically an indicates, uh, it's a score that our software gives, uh, which says how good the binding between the ACE2 and the uh, uh, coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2 is going to be. 
So we choose a cutoff um, by plotting all possible uh, case to double mutant uh, and rank them. And once we rank them, uh, we take a cutoff uh, score. And then we are basically plotting the all the mutations that you can, that will have a beneficial effect in terms of binding, right? So a lot of you, what, uh, what is the good thing here? Uh, on the right, you are seeing this matrix where we are looking at because it's a double mutation. Uh, so you are, you have you have residue number in the ACE2 on the X and the same thing is on the Y axis. And then you are looking at these green lines are the inter, the contact between the surface of the ACE2 and the, and the RBD domain of the coronavirus. And uh, so you there you're finding mutations which are at the interface, which is pretty good, but you're also finding a lot of mutations and their occurrence is also very high. Uh, which are not at the interface, and that could potentially enhance the enhance the the binding. Uh, so that's a really powerful approach because you know uh, some people could argue that okay, I have the crystal structure, I can look at the crystal structure, and I know what residues are at the interface, and uh, I can do appropriate mutation just using my intuition. Uh, but when you're dealing with a lot of sites that can be mutated, uh, then the intuition becomes a limiting thing, and there are mutations which are far away from the interface that are actually having an impact on the binding. Uh, so, uh, you know, we are capturing that and that's, uh, that's good. Uh, uh, the second thing is uh, you can be also started finding a lot of, so the question was, even with the cutoff score of, uh, uh, you know, with, for the score, you're finding a lot of mutations. Um, so, you know, these are millions of mutations that you can actually think of, which have a better binding potentially. So which ones are the, we should choose. So what we were looking at were, uh, you know, um, there were certain mutations which are just appearing a lot. So uh, the green circle that you're seeing in these in the residue position on the x-axis, uh, the green circles are the, in, you know, how many times we see this mutation appear in our top double mutants and, and which other residue they are coupled to. So you, there were a lot of very high ranking double mutants that we were predicting that were uh, really uh, always coupled to the other uh, sites. A lot of coupling were existing between these sites. So we said, okay, this, these are some of the, you know, very, very uh, sort of uh, likely mutations that will have an effect. And that is something that we can synthesize. And the, again, the good thing is they are not at the interface. Some of them are not at, they are out of the interface. Even. Um, and there are a lot of mutations in this uh, beginning region, zero to hundred. Um, um, and some of them were N33, N61, D60. They are appearing all, a lot uh, in the sequence. So we started combining these more, um, dominant or more popular, more likely uh, mutants uh, and started doing experiments, suggested experiments on them. So let me uh, let me just show you the experimental data. I'll show you the experimental data, but first I just wanted to show one uh, other thing, which is uh, some people might argue that, uh, you know, one of the things that we were thinking that, okay, we are predicting all these double mutants, but then, uh, you know, um, can a multiple sequence alignment just tell you that? If you just look at the MSA, um, the conservation score for a particular site uh, in the sequence, uh, does it capture that? That can can I identify mutations from that approach? And then if you look at this color bar at the bottom, uh, the blue is more variable, the red is uh, less variable, uh, and the bars that you are seeing are the ACE2 enrichment ratio, which is basically saying whether we have a better binding or not with the uh, with the spike. So there's just no correlation between the MSA's conservation score and the ACE2 enrichment ratio. So there is something else happening here. And it makes sense because, you know, uh, in, in a way that uh, uh, there's not that good evolutionary information for interaction between uh, coronaviruses and the human ACE2 proteins, right? So uh, these viruses might have evolved for a lot of different things, uh, not just binding to the uh, ACE2. Uh, so this is again a data now for our uh, expression uh, on the top. So the double mutants that we actually synthesized and did experiments, um, you know, uh, these are, uh, the expression remained more or less constant. So that's a good thing. That means you can produce this protein um, using uh, the, the cell line and everything that you're using. Uh, the second thing was that almost all the double mutants we were predicting were actually doing a very good, very good job. Uh, so we found a lot of these double mutants and, and, of, of, and then we combined some of these double mutants to get this quadruple mutant at the bottom uh, to actually have a, a much higher binding than the single uh, uh, single substitutions that we are getting. So now if you look at the KD measurements, which I have not shown here, 
these are like um, almost a nanomolar, sub nanomolar binding affinity. So then the, these proteins can actually compete with the uh, wild type ACE2. Uh, so that's pretty, um, pretty amazing. Um, uh, the other thing uh, we were saying, you know, the first thing that you need to look at, these are tissue culture plates uh, uh, for the uh, ACE2 expression. Uh, so we have a, we have a, a fluorescence uh, GFP attached to it. And when you're looking at this um, um, fluorescence from this expression, you actually find that these all these different variants that uh, we were, we think are the candidate, um, potentially candidate drugs or antivirals for treatment of coronavirus, they actually are expressing really well. So we can make a lot of these proteins. Okay. Uh, and their binding affinity uh, to the coronavirus is also pretty, pretty high. So we identified a lot of uh, these potential candidates that could actually be done, uh, you know, could go for an in vivo study. So uh, the good thing is uh, that we have a, a nice collaborator uh, working at um, in UI uh, Chicago, uh, who have actually done in vivo studies. Um, and it looks really, really promising uh, that this is all working even in the even in the um, in vivo studies with the with the mice, okay. So this uh, sounds pretty good. We have a new approach. We used it, and then uh, we are able to have candidates, um, uh, which actually works very well in vitro. Uh, and now we they actually work really really well even in the um, even when you're testing these things on the mice. Um, so one other question that keeps on uh, you know uh, everybody is worried about is so you have these you know uh, mutants now predicted. Uh, how effective are these um, uh, uh, quadruple mutant is that binding? But I think uh, my title should have been, um, you know, what would happen uh, if you have a variation, a variant of the coronavirus which has mutations on the interface? Because we know that the interface is variable and the coronavirus can rapidly change. Um, the interface could rapidly change from the virus side. So can your ACE2 mimics that you're generating now uh, compete with the with the with the virus. So one interesting thing that we found uh, is uh, so you know on the x-axis again you have this binding to the wild type ACE2, and on the y-axis uh, on the right you have binding to the um, uh, ACE2 that we have engineered. Okay. Uh, so what we are finding is that uh, there are a lot of variants uh, that the uh, mutations in the virus that actually enhance the binding. To the to the designed uh, uh, protein. So if you have this engineer ACE2, actually there are so many variations that are happening in the virus uh, that our mimic is actually in have, having an enhanced binding due to these variants that are coming in. Uh, and there's a, a smaller set of variations uh, that actually decrease the binding uh, to the engineered protein, but enhance to the wild type. So that's uh, pretty good. So uh, what we want is. Uh, we want the variants that are like. If you look at this diagonal, we want the we want the uh, uh, you know uh, the mimic is going to work really well for any variants that are above the diagonal. So which have a higher binding to the engineered twin, but weaker binding to the to the. Twin. Okay, uh, that would be good. Um, and obviously, we are my group is not just doing now ML uh, or AI is uh, we are a molecular dynamics group, uh, really. Uh, so, you know, we cannot, we have to do, there are a lot of people who have done molecular modeling of uh, uh, ACE2 and a spike interaction, but then the question uh, that we were asking is, now we have these variants of, uh, of ACE2, uh, what could we do to understand how this interaction is getting optimized? So, you know, uh, that's the interpretability question uh, from, the, from the machine learning and the neural networks. What we are getting is just a prediction that this mutant would work but we don't have an understanding of why. Uh, so we actually started looking at these uh, mutants. Uh, it's a, uh, we didn't do the entire spike and the entire ACE2, uh, but we just looked at the RBD domain and um, you know, part of the ACE2, uh, which, is the, which is forming the interface. And it's all 170,000 atoms, which is a very reasonably sized uh, system for doing long time scale MD. Uh, so we want to look at this association process between the uh, the ACE2 and the RBD domain, the spike, uh, and really understand what our mutants are doing, right? So, uh, you know, uh, one good thing that was happening while we were, uh, so I'm part of this uh, group of uh, uh, PIs who run uh, a folding at home uh, consortium. Uh, and uh, there are six of us uh, total. Uh, and the good thing that was happening while this coronavirus cases were uh, spiking, a lot of people were at home 
and they started donating a lot of time to this folding at home um, you know platform distributed computing platform and you can see all over the world people were donating and uh, there was a time in uh, may and june where um, you know in comparison to blue waters uh, the uh, the folding at home was 100 times more computing power than the blue water supercomputer and maybe you know eight to ten times the size of the the biggest computer supercomputer in the country so uh, there was a lot of computing power available so we can really do a lot of variance and uh, actually look at the binding so uh, we started uh, doing that uh, so one of the strategies that we use um, to do these simulations uh, was to do an adaptive sampling and uh, this is the movie I made uh, when I was a student, uh, but it's still pretty useful in explaining the process. Uh, so what you're seeing here um, is a, a toy potential. We call it a model potential uh, in computational chemistry. And here I'm doing uh, adaptive sampling on the left and the single molecular dynamics trajectory on the right. Um, and so what's happening is um, we run a lot of independent calculations on folding at home because these volunteers are donating their computer time and they are, don't have like big machines, right? So they can just run short simulations. We're running a lot of short simulations, thousands and thousands of short simulations every day. And at the end of the day, we are clustering all that data and then run more simulations from the new points. And, uh, you know, in this case, you know, we typically just go with the least sampled regions of the, of the landscape. Uh, so for example, if I want to go from uh, a well here to well on this side, uh, you know, uh, we are just seeding a lot of simulations, starting from the regions that are least visited, and then moving, uh, running more and more simulations. And that simple strategy of adaptive sampling actually gives you a very high performance in terms of uh, confirmation sampling of the of, uh, of the landscape. Whereas if we look at a single long molecular dynamics trajectory, it just sits in this uh, minima, and it just waits for that one single uh, big thermal fluctuation to happen to take you out. Uh, so this approach is uh, pretty efficient. So we can really uh, sample very long time scale processes uh, with a limited amount of, uh, it's still very high, but I would say much uh, more efficient uh, than the long time scale. And, uh, I will, uh, I'll just also, uh, you know, plug in some of the things that we are doing uh, uh, to enhance this uh, adaptive sampling scheme uh, is one of the, one of the things that um, we have reported is uh, use of reinforcement learning to do these simulations. Uh, so, for example, uh, one thing that realizes uh, molecular dynamics uh, people who are doing simulations is that there are always there are a lot of optimal locally optimal coordinates for sampling. So, for example, um, you know, what should I say that um, uh, let's say if I uh, if if I have a change happening in this protein, this is a transporter protein. There's a change happening in this protein uh, where it closes in the bottom and then it opens at the top. So when you are going from this open inside to, to closed on both sides, you are changing just the blue line here. But whereas when you are going to the outward open, you're changing this red line. So these, um, these order parameters, these are order parameters, distances in the protein, you can say, which we have used uh, to actually um, identify the most optimal local coordinate at a given point in a trajectory, given point on a landscape, rather than just using all the reaction coordinates. So uh, this is very common. Uh, what I've shown you is protein folding. You will have locally optimal coordinates. Uh, you're looking at enzyme dynamics, like a kinase. Uh, I've shown you a very simple example of a kinase activating. Uh, there also you have this unfolding of the red loop and then these uh, C helix or this helix sort of comes inside and activates the enzyme. So these things are very common. These locally optimal coordinates are everywhere. And we, then what we do is we basically, um, uh, identify a list of all possible coordinates, and then we attach weights to them, and then we uh, refine the weights as we are doing simulations. So what happens is if some uh, variable is not important in the simulation, it just becomes, the weight becomes zero, and when it becomes important, the weight again increases. So I'm just showing you a toy example here. We have done it on a lot of different systems now. So uh, imagine that you have this L-shaped landscape and you want to go from one corner to the other. Uh, you can do uh, you know state-of-the-art adaptive sampling. You reach far a little bit further, but then when you're doing this uh, reinforcement learning based adaptive sampling, what happens is it knows that you have to go in the X direction first based on how it is sampling the landscape. And then it identifies the Y direction as the most important one. And then it moves in that direction. So uh, you get much more efficient sampling than the, uh, than the regular adaptive sampling that I just showed you. And here I'm showing you the weights for the two variables X and Y. 
and then we added a random number uh, as another variable and you know this z weight goes to zero because it's not correlated with the uh, the underlying dynamics so initially the x direction is important its weight is high then the y direction becomes important it weights its weight becomes high and then you can sample this landscape much more efficiently uh, and then the bottom we are showing if you do 100 iterations of uh, this method and the single long trajectory versus least account based adaptive sampling versus reap you get a very 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 good um, sampling of the conformation of the energy landscape so it's pretty good uh, we use uh, uh, we use this reap and then we uh, once we have all this data we build markov state models uh, from these data these are essentially uh, kinetic network models uh, and uh, you can think of them as uh, a b c d are different conformations of the protein and you are using simulations to estimate the the rates between them and once you know the all the rates uh, for interconversion of all the conformations of a protein you can write down a really nice matrix which gives you the probability of transition between different conformations and then use it to derive a lot of very uh, interesting uh, properties of your protein dynamics so i'm not going to great details of markov state model a lot of people have, have worked in this space and I cannot even cite all of them here. So, uh, so what do we do now? Uh, how do we build these models? I'll just quickly go through it. So we have a ton of simulation data. We have a lot of trajectories. And then based on the shape of the protein, uh, in this case, it will be, let's say, how far are the ACE2 and the, how far are the ACE2 and the RBD domain? What is their orientation with respect to each other? What kind of confirmations exist at the interface? Based on some of those criteria, we can, I can assign them into different confirmations, which are different color boxes, and then I can calculate the probability of uh, these boxes appearing in the trajectory. And we can make a nice, and what, how many transitions happen between different colors. So what is green to green transition, how many happen? Green to blue transitions, how many happen? So how many of these happen? And then I can really uh, build a nice probability matrix and then get a very nice, uh, properties uh, such as uh, population of the individual conformations of this protein. Uh, I can get uh, you know, dynamics of a lot of these processes uh, and I can identify what are the important interactions that are around those um, changes. Okay, so this was my uh, intro to um, Markov models. So, okay, we did all of that. We do a lot of very long time scale simulations. We, we build these models from those long time simulations. And then we did all, you know, a lot of these single point mutations and what I'm saying, uh, what I'm showing you are just the, uh, um, you know, the interaction between some of the key residues on the ACE2 and the RBD domain and compare them to viral type. And what we are seeing is uh, that this, all these mutants are actually just uh, making the interaction or making the interaction stable are uh, forming an interaction that shifts the population towards, uh, you know, brings them, brings the two, dome, two proteins really close to each other. Okay, uh, so there's something that's expected. Uh, if you look at like a correlation in the bound uh, form of these mutants versus let's say wild type, I've just given one example, you can see correlations that exist between the two proteins. So if you have a strong binding, what happens is that your dynamics uh, as the two proteins are moving, they start behaving as if they're a single protein. So their motions get coupled very strongly. And we see that you know, happening in all of these uh, different mutants. So this is just one example where you can see how strongly coupled are the interaction between the green and the and the blue uh, uh, and the cyan protein. And then finally, uh, if I look at our triple mutant that uh, is going for the in vivo studies, what it was doing is um, it uh, these mutations were very strategically pay placed. Obviously we didn't know, uh, but the machine learning algorithm predicted them uh, that we were introducing uh, multiple hydrogen bonds at the interface uh, on the loop one and loop two of the ACE2 and the spike. And that was actually further stabilizing the binding um, and making it a, like a sub nanomolar uh, binder. And what you're seeing in the other plots is that how strong the binding is that uh, 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 the, the conformation of the uh, of the proteins, uh, two proteins at the interface just gets strongly logged. And there's a big peak, uh, you know, shifted towards the lower values in all of them. Okay, so this, uh, this was pretty good. That's why these things are working. Uh, if I look at the, if I look at it in terms of uh, what we call as time-independent components, uh, which is basically uh, if I identify what are the key uh, conformational states of the protein, and if I try to plot, uh, you know, the two slowest processes that are happening during the binding, uh, what I find is, uh, you know, the wild-type protein as it is binding can exist in a lot of different conformations. 
Uh, whereas uh, when you have a triple or a quadruple mutant that we have introduced, what it what it does is it just eliminates all the weak binding uh, states between the two proteins and just makes that that one one interface that is really really stable uh, dominant interface. So you know what these mutations are strategically placed to just log the interface and have a very strong binding. Okay, so these were um, these are really long simulations done on Azure and on and on unfolding at home. Okay, um, I think uh, last points, uh, last few things, you know, everybody's saying, okay, you are focused on ACE2, what about the variants that are happening on the virus itself, right? So think about, uh, uh, think about this virus, this is the, the so-called uh, English uh, mutation, um, and, uh, you know, the, the mutations are actually happening on the spike, not on the ACE2. So can we do use the same strategy to actually predict the effect of the binding of the spike with the ACE2. Uh, so what we have done is now, the good thing was we didn't have to do experiments for this. Uh, the paper came out uh, you know, uh, last year in fall uh, in cell, uh, which actually did um, a mutational scan on the RBD uh, domain. And then now what we, we are able to do is uh, use all that data and we are able to predict uh, a lot of higher order mutations that actually will have a very strong binding with the, uh, with the ACE2. So, now you can uh, start predicting the inf how infectious the variants are going to be. So if any variant comes out in a future, um, and uh, and uh, you know the infection is driven mostly by this interaction between the ACE2 and the virus a spike, uh, we can actually predict uh, how strong will be the uh, will be the binding uh, between this variant of the virus and the human ACE2 receptor. And so you can potentially, you know, correlate to the infectivity of the of that variant. So that's also pretty uh, pretty cool. Uh, what are we doing right now? Uh, so one from methodological viewpoint, uh, what we are doing is, uh, you know, we are doing these transfer. Then the question is, if I want to do transfer to the other viruses, um, then uh, what is the extent of transferability? Or we are looking at, you know, uh, we are doing these uh, type of experiments and uh, simulations and uh, AI uh, work on different protein families as well. Then the question is, what is the extent of transferability? Where does it break down? How similar should be the two proteins? So that's something that we need to understand. Uh, in vivo studies, as I said, are going on. This paper should come out uh, uh, maybe early May. Uh, we are looking at now the next step is really is to look for antibodies. Uh, so what we have done for the ACE2 is, is pretty interesting, uh, but the next uh, thing would be to predict uh, uh, predict interaction between the antibodies and the spike, uh, and that's a future direction potentially. Um, and then uh, the next thing that we I really want to think about uh, more is uh, there is going to be this rapid uh, design cycle every year uh, if it becomes uh, a, you know sort of endemic where it appears every year the virus, uh, then you need to think of new antivirals or uh, or adjust the antivirus every year, right? So, uh, you know, we need to think of how to do a rapid design and test cycle so that we have a way, we have a, uh, you know, an ACE2 mimic that can actually bind to any variants in future. So most of the work is done by these uh, four students, uh, three students actually uh, in my group. Um, and these are all chemical engineering students. And with that, I. Thank you. And what you're seeing here, the cats, we, we really, uh, my students really love cats. So these are their avatars. Um, and the people who are circled here are the people who have done all the work. Uh, and I cannot thank uh, C3.ai uh, more. Uh, you know, uh, this, was, um, this was the idea and the funding has really helped us, uh, you know, take it to the next level. Uh, and Eric Procco, who is uh, the experimental collaborator, he has really driven all the cool experiments results that you're seeing here. So thank you. Thank you so much. That was just great. Um, I have to tell you, I would like to follow up with you about your research because I've got some particular interest in this, but there are questions in the Q&A. Sure. And I'm going to start um, commenting on what they are saying. So Sugana, Sugunu Sakya says, for adaptive simulations, how long would you run the system? Um, so, um, I mean, um, for these systems, I already sort of showed you what we were able to run. These are really big systems for, um, you know, uh, in terms of long simulations. But if you look at the, um, you know, the microseconds here, uh, this is like a few milliseconds of data uh, for the different variants. Um, so uh, in, in general, if you have a process that takes, um, 
let's say um, 100 microseconds, then you at least need uh, 100 microseconds of data to actually build a good Markov model on it. Uh, so adaptive sampling would uh, actually give you uh, speed up uh, uh, where you don't have to sample that process like 10 times uh, longer. So if the process is 100 microseconds, you don't have to do a millisecond of uh, simulations. You can just get uh, a good uh, stats on that process in just 100 microseconds. So the most slowest time scale sort of determines your um, determines your time required for making a good model. I hope that answers your question. Um, the next question is from the same person. Uh, yeah. If you want to select a representative structure to start a new run, what's the criteria you applied to select the structure? So uh, there are uh, various uh, approaches that could be used. You can think of that. Uh, the easiest one or the most efficient one uh, is uh, has been so far. Uh, the least count ways where you're saying uh, where you're where you're basically picking the new structures uh, from the regions that are least visited. So, for example, if I if I run a short simulations and I only export a little bit of the landscape, then essentially you're picking your starting structure from that area that is uh, you know looks like a high energy or not visited, uh, which is visited very little. So you're at the edge of the landscape that you have explored, and then you're going further and further out. So the least count really helps with that. Uh, but what we have shown is that if you know the reaction, you know the likely order parameter, or you can put in a long list of order parameters, then we can do reinforcement learning using those order parameters and then just identify from your you know, long list of order parameters, which one is the most important one uh, during the similar sampling. And th I think that makes it more efficient uh, in terms of sampling. I hope okay. that answers your question. Yeah, great. Uh, I'd like to suggest to the participants, you put some questions into the Q&A, but I have some others. Can we predict the effect of even higher order mutations that could enhance binding affinity between the ACE2 and spike protein? Uh, so, um, you know, what we have, uh, um, uh, so uh, we have tried to predict the third order and the fourth order mutations, uh, but um, uh, with, with some success, but obviously uh, there, uh, one bottleneck has been that there is no third order mutation data to really compare against. So we have predicted, but we just don't know how good it is. That has been one problem. The second thing is uh, the other approach that we have done, we have now used to really optimize the uh, optimize the uh, the binding further was uh, uh, was to combine our double mutants and then pick out a fourth order uh, or a fifth order mutation. That would actually be very good at it. But what we are increasingly finding is that once you go to the, you introduce five mutations or six mutations at the interface, then the protein stops folding properly. So I think they're very good with three or four mutations, uh, which could be predicted from uh, the double order mutations. Uh, but if you go higher, uh, you start getting proteins that is that could have very strong binding, but not other properties such as folding. Okay. Uh, okay. Um you mentioned in your conclusion that you want to work on interactions between spike protein S and antibodies. Could you give us some more details about what you would do? Uh, yeah, so, um, uh, you know, that's a, that's a new, uh, that's a next step for us uh, because, uh, you know, we could, uh, uh, we could start working. Uh, um, uh, so for example, certain, a lot of companies are coming out with this um, antibodies but we don't know uh, which variants of this antibody or what variation should be introduced in these antibodies uh, for optimized binding to the spike protein. Um, and the, the, what the approach that I've actually outlined could just be used to further optimize some of these antibodies. The other approach would be if we know the human, if we can isolate the antibodies from the serum that are dominant, uh, we, could, uh, we could start with that sequence and then optimize uh, that sequence to create new antibodies uh, for the for the spike, I think that's that's the um, that's one area we want to work. But first, we have to get um, you know, we are thinking about it, and maybe by the end of the summer or something, we might have a good um, a good model and uh, experiments on it. Okay, I have one more question, um, which is from a methodological viewpoint: What would be the key developments that might be able to advance this approach of a com of combining? ML and high throughput experimentation. Um, yeah, uh, so uh, my answer is, uh, so one of the things that we really want to do from the methods viewpoint is, uh, you know, um, let me just go back to one of my slides. Um, so you saw the, 
at the very beginning, um, I showed you the matrix. Uh, you know, you have this lot of these, uh, again, yeah. So you look at this matrix now, uh, you have so much, uh, so much experimental data, but this experimental data is just saying, you know, plus or minus really. Uh, it's whether it's enhanced or whether it's lower. Uh, so one thing that we, um, we are, my group is now focusing on is how could we add interpretability to this data? Like how could we, uh, what, I, what I really want to do is just go into this box and you click on that box and then it can tell you uh, why this uh, mutant did not have any effect or why it had a positive effect and why it had a negative effect. Um, and it has to be a, it has to be a way where we have to combine um, uh, um, simple models for protein protein binding or uh, along with this uh, all the uh, deep mutational scans um, to make it happen. So that's uh, basically I'm restating the interpretability problem uh, for ML here, where if you have a higher order mutations, you know that it. Uh, it works, but I have no idea why it works. So adding a physical model somewhere, uh, which can rapidly give that, um, you know, explain that observation. I think that's what we want to really do. Um, okay, great. There's another question in the, in the Q and A. Grace. Um, Grace Yuen says, great talk. I apologize if I miss this point, but are there known polymorphisms in ACE2 in the population that overlap with some of the mutations and sites you've identified that make ACE2 bind RBD more strongly and stabilize the binding surface. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a very interesting point. So, you know, that's where, uh, this is something that, you know, is on my uh, sort of a to-do list because it, what it will do is it will explain, um, you know, could, uh, are there certain populations which will be, uh, which will have a less um, uh, prone to uh, coronavirus infection, right? Uh, you can even explain that, right? So, uh, uh, so the, the good thing is, you know, C3.ai, for example, has all this. Uh, uh, it's a huge uh, sequence database that uh, the ACE2, which we have used for, um, you know, doing the POTS model stuff earlier. Uh, but this is something that we have not, you know, explicitly looked at. But I think this is a very interesting story there, uh, where you can, um, uh, based on someone's, uh, you know, uh, um, genome and ACE2 sequence, you can actually predict uh, the extent of the um, infection. That they are pro how prone they are to catching the virus. Uh, so that's an interesting idea. That's something that's on our mind, but we have just not done it. So you got another question in the q and I'm really glad. Um, Shashank Pant says, amazing talk. By design, most of the ML methods work in data-rich regimes. Did you observe similar correlations with TL mutation design as well? Um, uh, I, would say, I would say yes, because, you know, uh, you know that's... Uh, 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 the uh, I mean the single point mutation data for so many different sites, uh, it's, it's it's rare to generate for another protein. Uh, there will be, be fifty or sixty proteins total in literature for which this type of uh, mutational landscapes have been generated. So that's it's rare. Uh, it's a it's obviously rich data. Uh, I, I completely agree with it. Um, uh, but uh, you know what you're doing is that uh, we are using this rich data that is the best data that we can get. But then now you are going, you're making predictions in a very data poor regime uh, to use it. So that's one way of thinking about what is the real impact of this work. Uh, the second thing is, um, uh, the second thing that uh, is very interesting uh, in development that's are happening and that could be integrated with the methods that we are developing uh, is for example, we are finding, uh, uh, you know, what about shallow uh, multiple sequence alignment, right? So if you have a really uh, poor sequence alignment of your, for your, for your protein, can you predict mutations for that? Um, because your base model uh, that you're generating from the sequence is, all, is already very poor, right? So what, what I'm finding uh, recently with the development of this new um, uh, uh, methods for based on transformers, uh, actually shallow multiple sequence alignment have been used to get a lot of uh, information that is fed into the POTS model. Uh, so that's a one way where uh, one approach where uh, you have an ML technique that is actually making use of the, uh, you know, that could work in a data poor regime to predict the effect of uh, mutations. So I'm really glad you just mentioned multiple sequence alignment because my personal question was going to be about multiple sequence alignment. Yeah. Can you explain what you mean by shallow multiple sequence alignment? Uh, I mean, just uh, not many independent uh, sequences uh, per site. 
so what we typically need is, uh, uh, you know, uh, for each site in the sequence, uh, you need at least uh, that many uh, number of residues should be, as this is again heuristic, uh, but a uh, uh, number of uh, independent sequences in your multiple sequence alignment uh, should be uh, same as the number of the residues to get a good uh, parameters for this parts model. So we just, if we don't have independent, a uh, lot of independent sequences for a particular protein, uh, then- Then your model that, is, is impaired. Okay, yeah. so there's two issues that you just brought up. One is just um, how many sequences you have, right? Because yeah. you need to have it look like as much as you have the length of the alignment. Yeah. But there's also just the accuracy of the alignment. Do you have any issues around the accuracy of the alignment? Um, it didn't seem like you might. It sounds like you might have easy alignments because these things, even if they're evolving, they're not evolving very quickly. So one question is just about, do you have any issues around accuracy? The second question, second question is, you're, you've only talked about alignment. You haven't talked about an evolutionary perspective. Do you have any kind of use of a, a phylogeny that would be useful? Um, I think the first, uh, again, I would say uh, we have... Uh, um, um, I would, uh, you know, you are an expert, so I will, <laughs> I will, I will be very, uh, I will be very careful here. And so, I, what I would say is that, uh, you know, we have just used standard tools for uh, for sequence alignment, uh, and we uh, we could get a really nice uh, alignment for a lot of sites from based on all the sequence data. So we didn't um, we didn't worry about it. We didn't worry about it. Uh, probably that, didn't um, need to. Is what I was thinking. But what yeah. about a phylogeny? Have you looked at whether or not you can get a insights from the phylogeny? Yeah, so I think that's uh, that's a that's a that's a very interesting one, and that sort of also goes back to, um, uh, also goes back to that question about uh, uh, different ACE2 variants in the population, right? Uh, sort of. Uh, so uh, uh, one thing that we um, uh, one thing uh, that sort of is related to uh, was that there was an IGM team that was doing uh, work on. Uh, uh, different phylogenies of the uh, making of a nice phylogeny, uh, making a phylogeny of the virus, and then actually looking at uh, 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 using that to sort of say uh, what virus uh, could be uh, found in the population, or which which virus could appear likely appear, uh, and then trying to predict their binding to the uh, to the virus. I think this is the extent of what uh, we have done with the phyl with the phylogenetic tree and the phylogeny of the virus. Okay. Um, another so question we, in the Q and A, though. Oh, so, along similar lines, um, so Shankpan, I hope I've answered your question. Again, I'm not. Fine, a we'll follow up. Yeah. Okay. Uh, along the similar lines, you also mentioned in version two, CNN based. Uh, you're incorporating structural and what type of structural features are these, and how do you get from simulations or a static structure? Yeah. So this is very interesting uh, question, Shashank. Uh, so what uh, you know, um, there are a lot of uh, sequence based uh, variant effect predictors that have become common. Uh, but I think the structure-based uh, predictors are rare. Um, I have, uh, I would say that there's one paper that came out uh, last uh, month, one month ago, that has sort of scooped this idea. Uh, it's a fast-moving field. Uh, so in the structure, what we are doing is um, uh, we are looking at, uh, for example, I mean, the good thing is that there's a lot of structured information now for the coronavirus and especially for the ACE2 uh, spike protein. So what we are looking at is uh, for every single amino acid in the protein, uh, we are creating these maps of uh, distribution of different types of atoms around it. And then we are feeding that distribution of all those atoms around, uh, around this amino acid uh, as, a, as, a, in, as a channel uh, or input to the, to the CNN. So what is happening there is, uh, 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 let's say I have a mutation that is, let's say, from positive to negative, uh, then you, you, know, uh, you will see... Um, uh, you will see that it's a it's a very destabilizing mutation because the interaction between this um, charge and the opposite charge and the um, residues around it will be really bad. So all this type of information, where uh, you know, like uh, simple things like like to like substitution, um, the size of the residue, um, you know, all those things could be captured uh, if you have the structural context of the of the of the residue. The more interesting one, which you will find more interesting, is uh, you know, uh, there is very little dynamics on the interface between the ACE2 and RBD. But now think about the kind of proteins that we work on. Uh, let's say membrane transporter, where there's a huge amount of conformational change happening. There, now you have to think about not just one conformation. You have like n conformations of this protein that are happening, and some of these conformations will affect will 
will explain the effect of uh, one type of variant uh, on and, and another confirmation will explain the effect of the other type of variant. So how do you essentially what I'm saying is you now in Markov state model into the into the this ML pipeline. So that's the most fascinating question in future. Actually, your whole thing is completely fascinating. Thank you so much. Um, we're thank out you. of time, but I think you can follow up with uh, some of the questions afterwards. And thank you again. And I'll be writing thank you, to thank you. anyway. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks and thank you for C to C3.ai and for funding this work. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.